Today uh, we'll have the second of the two uh, installment, the two installments on uh, integer programming, and uh, I uh, I clearly have a lot more than what I could uh, say in one and a half hours. So uh, you know there is some stuff here that I, I will not be able, to, I will have to skip, but I wanted to put it there anyway as a, as a reference. Uh, so let, just a quick recap, uh, what is this business of integer programming? Um, you know, it's kind of like what we have been talking about so far. Minimize a function subject to some constraints. If you want, think about convex function subject to some convex constraints. And then we add this, at first, seemingly innocuous uh, additional restriction, right? That the variables, that some of the variables be uh, integer. Uh, even though that is, you know, innocuous looking, it actually makes the problem uh, computationally much more challenging. Uh, but at the same time, the presence of those kinds of uh, variables also adds an enormous modeling power to uh, the optimization model. Um, so we saw some examples last time, uh, and I'll mention a couple of examples today. And we ended uh, with this general uh, algorithmic template that is, um, is the most popular way of solving integer programs, and this is called branch and bound, okay, branch and bound. And if I were to summarize branch and bound in one sentence, is, it's kind of an enumeration uh, approach. It's an enumeration approach, uh, but it's not just a brute force enumeration to solve um, that problem, to, to, to tackle the combinatorial part aspect of that problem. It's not just a brute force enumeration. It's a somewhat intelligent enumeration where uh, we combine the idea of enumeration of divide and conquer with some clever use of upper and lower bounds so that uh, part of that enumeration procedure can be done more efficiently. Um, so here is, the, here is the actual branch and bound algorithm. So if we uh, consider the same problem right, from the previous slide, we want to solve that problem at the very root of the branch and bound algorithm, at the very beginning, we could start by solving the convex relaxation. That is, the relaxation is just uh, ignoring the integrality constraints. If that happens to be infeasible, right? If this is infeasible, this is a relaxed version of the original problem, then we're done, right? The, the original problem has to be infeasible. And then that's the If the solution to this problem also is feasible for the original problem, right? Then given that it is optimal for this relaxed problem, if it is feasible for the original problem, it has to be optimal. So again, that is, easy, that is an easy case, and in that case, we're done. Then the difficult solution to the uh, relaxed problem is not feasible for the original problem. So for instance, uh, that would happen if one of the components of x star that is supposed to be integer is not integer. In that case, what we can do is branch. So we round that component to uh, below and above, generate two problems, and then we recursively so solve the two uh, subproblems. So that's, that's the basic idea. Now, um, a detail that I mentioned last time, but I want to uh, highlight it again, is when we do this, right, if we recursively solve the two subproblems, or however problems we, we decide to uh, branch on, a key uh, component of branch and bound is that the first thing that we do with the subproblems is compute lower bounds for them uh, by solving, for example, a relaxation. And if the lower bound is better than the best solution that we have managed to, uh, to attain so far, then we, cannot, we, we don't need to consider that subproblem. So we can, in some way, trim part of the enumeration procedure that way. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the key element, the key component of branch and bound. And uh, the, what are the ways of computing lower bounds? The, the typical way of computing lower bounds is to look at convex relaxations, so do something like what we do here. This is a way of getting a lower bound on our original problem. So here, for each one of the subproblems, we can do the same thing to compute lower bounds. All right. Um, so that's branch and bound, OK? Now, uh, this, there was a, a little example that came up in our discussion on Monday 
if I, want, if I could refresh your memory, it had to do with the facility location problem. There were two equivalent uh, formulations, one that had far more constraints than another one, and they were both equivalent if we look at the entire formulation. So if you think about that, essentially we had an example of a situation like this, where we had one formulation, right, where we had many more constraints, and another formulation that also got the job done, but it had fewer constraints. Okay? So if you think about the underlying, say, uh, convex relaxation, right? the underlying convex relaxation, the one that has more constraints means that the convex relaxation is going to be, um, the, the feasible set is going to be smaller okay? because it had more constraints. So the question, I would like to reiterate the same question that I asked last time and I want to see a show of hands, how many of you would prefer the formulation that is more constrained, okay, this formulation, as opposed to this formulation? Which one is preferable? Or maybe you're indifferent. So how many of you would prefer the one that is more constrained? Okay, that's kind of what I expected. And, uh, Okay, so some of you still prefer the one with less, with fewer constraints. How many of you prefer that? Okay, so good. So now you're on the minority, which should be the case. Because uh, maybe someone from the majority who uh, voted for the more constrained uh, could air, why would you prefer that? Why, what, what, what is there to like about the more constrained formulation? What is to like about that? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, it has to do with the branch and bound, exactly. And it, it's not just that we are enumerating, but we are also making use of low and an upper bounds. So if you have a tighter uh, relaxation, then the lower bound that you're going to get is tighter. Okay? If you have a very loose relaxation, then the bound that you get is, is going to be of much less quality. So because the business of bounding is so critical for branch and bound. Uh, this is something that at first it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but when you're dealing with integer uh, programming models, generally, as a rule of thumb, the more constraints you can put in your model, the better. Okay? Because when you look at the relaxation, the, the convex relaxation that typically is much easier to solve than the original uh, integer program, the relaxation is going to be tighter. It's going to give you more information. It's going to give you better quality bounds. Uh, so the answer here is you should always prefer, well, you should generally prefer the more constrained one, the more constrained one. Okay, so in particular, if you revisit that facility location problem, there were two formulations. The first one should be the preferred one. Um, okay, so here's the plan for today. I want to tell you about, so we, we discussed branch and bound. I want to give you an idea of an alternative way of solving um, integer programs that is called cutting things um, and a variant of branch and bound that was coined this name branch and cut. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say both cutting planes and branch and cut, they have been extensively uh, studied, especially here on this campus. I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. And then in the second half of the class, we'll talk about two uh, examples. Um, you know, given how much material I have, actually, I'll be happy if we can, can get through the first one. And if we have a bit of slack, then I'll mention the second one. Uh, so we'll mention the best subset selection uh, problem in some detail. And if we have time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the second one, the least mean square, median squares. Uh, so, what is this business of, um, so let me put back the outline here. What is this business of cutting planes? In some way, uh, talking about cutting planes, in some way, I would argue that has, uh, has a more direct connection with the subject, of, the main subject of this course, and that is uh, convex, convexity and convex optimization. Uh, so, here's a nice little exercise that, uh, uh, it's like a one-line proof, so I'm not going to do it, but you can easily do it if you don't see it immediately. 
suppose that we look at an at a integer program, uh, but a particular type of integer program where the objective is linear. Okay? So the objective is linear. Uh, it turns out that if you have any kind of convex objective, you can always push at the, uh, via maybe an extra variable, you can always push the objective to the constraints and recast the problem so that you have a linear objective. Now, if you have a linear objective, here is something that is kind of neat. Uh, so you have your constraints. The constraints include some convex set, some convex constraints, and some uh, integer constraints. So it turns out that the original problem is equivalent, at, at least as far as it has to do with the optimal value. The original problem is equivalent to optimizing over the convex hull of the feasible set of the integer program. And that is just a straightforward consequence of uh, linearity. Because the function, because the objective function is linear, it is the same to optimize over the complicated uh, integer, the, the complicated feasible set of the integer program as it is to optimize over the convex hull. Okay? It's just a consequence of linearity. Okay, so it, it's a very simple verification. So, uh, so this observation then suggests that there could be an alternative to solving uh, integer programs. What if we, since now this problem, by construction, this problem is a convex problem, then you could say, well, I, all I need to do to get the solution to my original problem and then is find a description to this convex hull if I have a description to this convex hull, then now this is a convex optimization problem. I can hit it with all the machinery that I know about convex optimization that I learned in the last several months. So that is the idea of uh, convexification, and that is the idea that uh, underlies cutting planes. So in particular, here is a, an instantiation of this idea. This is a really cool theorem. Uh, so if, if the set here, if C, the set, is polyhedral, so this applies, I guess, to uh, integer linear programming. If we have an integer linear program, like uh, the optimization problem there at the top, uh, this is a cool theorem. When you look at the convex hull of the feasible set, that too is a polyhedron. Okay? This, is not, this is not a triviality. This is actually a deep, uh, uh, interesting result. Uh, so, this set is a polyhedron, right? So what this means is that the original problem, in principle, in principle, is just as difficult as solving a linear program, okay? Now, how, how hard could that be? Well, this, is a, uh, this theorem says that if I look at the feasible points of that problem, I take the convex hull, then I get a polyhedron. But here is the catch. The description of that polyhedron could be enormously complicated. So it could be a polyhedron with a, a, a large, a, a huge number of uh, inequalities. So uh, in particular, you know, this, is, this has been well studied. You, can, you could start with a, an integer linear program that has only a certain number of uh, constraints. And when you look at the convex hull of the integer solutions, even though it's a polyhedron, it can have exponentially many uh, faces, exponentially many facets. So the description of this set is, is very complicated. Even though it's a polyhedron, it's, it's complicated. So the idea of cutting planes is that we, in some way, rely on this kind of result, on this theorem, but we don't really attempt to describe S entirely. Instead, we describe S uh, as we need it. So here is uh, the, the key, I guess, a key idea for um, cutting plane methods. Uh, this is a little piece of terminology. We say that uh, an inequality, a linear inequality, is valid for a convex set if uh, essentially the corresponding half space contains that convex set, okay? So it's kind of what you would guess a valid inequality is. Uh, so now let's consider this problem. The 
idea of uh, cutting planes is that to solve that problem, in some way we are going to rely on this fact. How so? So here is in words what we are going to, what cutting planes do. If you want to solve this problem, you can proceed as follows. Solve the relaxation, and then if the relaxation didn't give you a solution to the problem, is because uh, you need to cut off the, the, the solution that you found is not integer. You need to cut it off. Cut it off with something that is valid, that is valid for your problem. And then resolve. That is essentially the idea. So if I were to make a picture here, uh, here is how the cutting plane, uh, a cutting plane algorithm uh, works. So we solve the convex relaxation. So suppose that to make the, the, the drawing a little bit easier, I'm going to assume that it's an integer linear program. So suppose that my, my constraints are something like this, right? And my objective function, so suppose that this is this is my set A, X, less than or equal to B. This is my C. And suppose that my objective function is like this. This is my C objective function. So when we solve the convex relaxation, we get this solution. Okay, so this would be the solution to the convex relaxation. Suppose that that is not, that is not uh, feasible. So here, imagine that all the grid points are the integer points. So if you look at that solution, that solution is not feasible. It's not feasible for the, uh, for the integer program. So the idea of a cutting plane is that we will get some inequality. So this will be a valid inequality. A valid inequality for the convex hull of the feasible points that cuts off this point. And then we resolve. And we keep adding valid inequalities uh, until eventually we get a solution. So the, the, algorithm, the algorithm essentially is something like what is described here. We start with the convex relaxation of our problem, compute the solution to that first convex relaxation. If, if we are lucky and that convex relaxation and that solution to the convex relaxation is feasible, then we are in good shape. We, we have solved the problem. OK, now, if it, if it isn't, then that means that uh, that solution that we found is outside the convex hull of the feasible points. So we, we find an inequality, a valid inequality that cuts off that point, but that is valid for the, uh, for the convex hull of the uh, of the, feasible, of the original problem. If you think about it, what this is doing is trying to get a closer description of the convex hull of the feasible points. So this is going to be now, this is going to lead us to a tighter relaxation of the original problem. So we solve the tighter relaxation and then we continue. If we do this correctly, if we do this properly, because we have that nice theorem from a few slides ago, We know that this convex hull is a polyhedron. Eventually, this will finish if we, if we are generating valid cuts in some kind of uh, uh, you know, smart way. So that is a cutting plane algorithm, okay? a cutting plane algorithm. And a little bit of terminology that goes with this, uh, a valid inequality like this is also called a cutting plane, or sometimes it's just called a cut. Okay? And the picture that you want to have in mind is this picture. It's called a cutting plane or a cut because it cuts off the point that I, uh, this, the solution of the relaxation that I realized is not a solution to my original problem. So I keep cutting and trimming the, the relaxation until eventually I find a solution to my problem. So that is, uh, that is uh, cutting planes. Okay. So I want to say a little bit of history about this because the, this History could be as, uh, how should I say, educational 
if not more, than the actual technical details of the algorithm. Uh, I find this kind of history to be really, really uh, insightful. So this, is, this goes back to the early days of uh, linear programming. So back to the founders, uh, Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson. They, uh, so Danzig was the inventor of linear programming and the simplex method back in the 40s, late 40s. So shortly after linear programming was found to be so useful for many types of different industrial operations, people started realizing that integer programming also provided a very powerful optimization tool, uh, but they still didn't have a very efficient way of solving integer programs. And uh, you know, now that we are 60 years later, we know that the reason there were no efficient ways of solving integer programs is because they are very hard to solve. But those guys didn't know that, right? So they were looking for the algorithm to solve integer programs. And uh, these guys, Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson, they were uh, particularly interested in, in, in one specific type of, com of combinatorial optimization problem, the traveling salesman problem. Um, so for many people, some of my colleagues who are a little bit older, many people thought, uh, many people who are, were outside operations research had this idea that operations research was traveling salesman problem, okay? Like, because the traveling salesman problem seems to be such a, such a central problem for a, a good number of years that for many people, the traveling salesman problem was like the entire profession of operations research. It's, a, of course, a poor description of what operations research is. But anyway, it's, it, it is a central problem in combinatorial optimization. So uh, Danzig and his collaborators uh, devised the first type of cutting plane algorithm for the traveling salesman problem. So it was very specific, very tailor-made for the traveling salesman problem. And then in the late 50s, a few years later, um, I think his name, his first name was Ralph, Ralph Gomore. He was working at the Navy. He was a mathematician. I think he had written his dissertation in differential equations, something very, very much in pure math. But then he needed to solve integer programs and he uh, proposed a very general cutting plane algorithm. Uh, unlike the approach of Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson, the uh, approach of Gomory was very general. In principle, in principle, it could solve any integer linear program. And then he proved that indeed the algorithm would always find a solution to any integer linear program. Uh, but that was not implemented, and that was not tested computationally. And the first few, uh, I guess, tests were not very promising. So after a few years, pretty much the popular wisdom was that cutting planes were kind of a nice theoretical curiosity that Gomory had uh, found. But if you needed to solve problems, you had to use branch and bound. Forget about cutting planes. They were useless. They were nice to prove maybe a little bit of theory, but they were not going to solve you any, pro any real problems. And that was pretty much the state of affairs for multiple decades. But then in the early 90s, okay, for after more than 30 years, something very peculiar happened. There was a student here in this campus, uh, Sebastian Syria, and his advisor asked him, his advisor is um, a professor at the Tepper School, uh, Gerard Cornejols, he asked him if he, to explore you know, Gomory cuts in, a, you know, for, in, in an algorithm for solving cutting planes. And the reason that his advisor thought about that is that he started looking through the literature and he started seeing that everyone dismissed cutting planes as, well, those algorithms don't work. But there was no really evidence that anyone had seriously implemented them and shown that they really break down. There was just you know, someone made that claim and then other people just bought that claim because someone that was very credible made that claim and then they wouldn't even try. And then for 30 years that went on. And then this guy, right, contrary to any kind of uh, possible, uh, 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 you know, sense or wisdom, decided to try that, right? And then he was very successful. He was so successful that by the late 90s, Actually, all the main players, uh, the main commercial vendors of optimization technology implemented uh, cutting plane technology. And now, now, today, that is an integral part of pretty much all optimization solvers. Of course, the story is not that smooth, right? So you can imagine that uh, 
this student and his advisor submitted a paper, and the editor that was handling the paper <laughs> immediately rejected it because it's like, okay, you're lying. Of course, we, know, we all know that cutting planes don't work. Uh, so, you know, it took a little bit of effort, but eventually they published that, and then they got a lot of credit for that. And in fact, the subject of cutting planes has this extensive uh, tradition at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, some of our biggest names, uh, this guy who is uh, still alive, he's one of my colleagues. He's a great guy. He's really a pleasure to, uh, to talk to, and he gives very, very nice uh, talks, and uh, he's still very active, even though he's very old. Uh, <laughs> So Balash Cornejos was a serious advisor. The two of them were serious advisors. Uh, this guy was, used to be in our faculty until he passed away a good number of years ago. Uh, Fatma is one of our more junior faculty. All of them have really made enormous advances in cutting plane uh, machinery and uh, really, really very significant advances that have really pushed forward the technology for solving integer programming uh, dramatically. And of course, many of their collaborators, I, there have been, I lost count of how many dissertations have the words cutting planes in their title. Okay, I have been to many of those. And it's a subject that is still uh, being extensively researched. So uh, I could go on talking about cutting planes for a long time, uh, but I will just give you maybe a little kind of a gist of uh, how is it that cutting planes work? How do you generate cutting planes, right? So this algorithm that I just described here, of course, doesn't, go in, doesn't describe, this is a key step, right? How do you find that valid inequality? You know, that, it, that is not obvious how you, you would find that valid inequality that cuts off the current point and is valid for, for the convex hull of the set. This is highly, it, that, is, that is not an obvious step. And especially how you find a, a useful enough valid inequality, a useful cut. So uh, what Gomory did you know, about 60, nearly 60 years ago was uh, based on the following incredibly simple observation. So if you think about, suppose that you have an inequality, A less than or equal to B, and you know that uh, A is integer. Okay? Because for example, A is a combination of your integer variables, so it has to be integer. Suppose that you know that A less than or equal to B is an inequality that has to hold, and A is integer. Then you can round B below, and that still has to hold. And that is a tighter inequality. So that is a very, very simple observation. And in some way, that is what underlies the idea that Gomori uh, proposed. So more generally, suppose that I know that my convex hull is contained in this set, okay? So Consider this very simple case. When I know that my convex hull is contained in the set of, say, points with integer entries, non-negative integer entries that satisfy one um, equation there. So if the right-hand side here, if the right-hand side here is not integer, then I can derive a cut by doing this kind of rounding procedure. So if I, if, I, if I round things this way, the inequality that I get here now is a, uh, a cut. And uh, this simple idea is essentially is what underlies the entire uh, area of um, cutting planes. Of course, there are many more elaborate extensions of this idea. Uh, there is this guy that I, uh, so oh, I forgot his first name, Vacek, I think. Shvato, he's a professor in some university in, uh, I think in Montreal. He is an absolute character. I, I got to see him once giving a talk uh, at Carnegie Mellon. If you ever see that name, please go to the talk because he will be very, very entertaining. Uh, I think the guy's a little bit crazy. So he, uh, so, but he's, he's a very smart guy. He also developed a new class of cuts. Then um, my colleague, Balash, he developed these split cuts, lift and project cuts, and a number of other things. Uh, maybe a quick, since I'm, I seem to be doing okay with time, let me tell you what the lift and uh, project cuts are. This is another way of, give, of, of uh, finding cuts for, for a particular class of integer programs. This, is, this applies when you have binary um, integer programs. 
and it's a really cool idea, is actually this could be, this could be a nice uh, exercise. Maybe it's a little bit challenging for the little test, so we may not exactly ask this, but it is a good exercise that you guys could try to solve, to do. It's, it's a good little problem. Suppose that you have a polyhedron, okay? C is a polyhedron. It's defined by so many qualities, AX less than or equal to B. And suppose that uh, either the inequality or you know, the other inequalities imply that the jth component is between zero and one, okay? So it's a polyhedron that is, is, is contained, if you look at the projection on the jth coordinate, it's contained between zero and one. And suppose that now you want to look at the convex hull of the set that you get if you take the polyhedron and intersect with zero and with one. Okay, so that would be, so CJ there is the convex hull of the points in C that have coordinates either equal to zero or equal to one. It turns out that that polyhedron, you can express, this is a very, very clever idea. You can express that polyhedron. CJ is the projection of this higher dimensional polyhedron. So if you, if you construct this bigger polyhedron in higher dimensions and you project, then you get back CJ, okay? And this theorem in gives a way to, uh, if you have, say, a point that is not in CJ, then it gives you a way to generate cuts uh, that cut off that point and that are valid for CJ. Okay, so this is one um, a little more elaborate type of uh, getting cuts for binary uh, integer programs. So here's how we can then combine the best of both worlds. That is, so let's see, here we had, uh, yeah, so here we had, this was branch and bound, right? Branch and bound was an enumeration approach, right? And then cutting planes was an approach based on finding tighter and tighter, um, tighter and tighter descriptions of the convex hull of the feasible set. Okay, so tighter and tighter relaxations of that set. So in principle, the two approaches kind of tackle the problem from different angles. So a branch and cut basically combines both of them. And you know, to be fair, this probably was the, the, the key insight that Sebastian had when he was a student here. He made cutting planes work by operating them in some way, trying to, to harness the power of cutting planes within a branch and bound framework. So branch and cut is a way of combining the two ideas of cutting planes and branch and bound. So again, suppose that that's the problem that we want to solve. Right? Suppose that that's the problem that we want to solve. So let me put it here. So that's our problem. So how is the branch and cut algorithm going to do it? Uh, it's going to look very familiar, very similar to branch and bound, and with, with a little element of cutting planes. So we do something very similar to branch and bound, that is solve the relaxation and proceed. So in this case, when we would branch, we just make a tweak in the algorithm we, we could, we decide if we want to branch or if instead we want to add cuts. Okay, so instead of doing the traditional branch and bound, the idea of branch and cut is that every time that you are faced with the decision to branch, you first consider instead adding cutting planes to your problem. Uh, so that is called a branch and cut algorithm, a branch and cut algorithm. Uh, so yeah, so that's that. So let me keep it here just for a moment. So that's branch and cut uh, algorithm. Okay. Now, uh, what is the kind of the state of affairs with integer programming technology? So, you know, this is one of those things that uh, as optimizers we have sometimes faced and is that if you want to be a user of this technology, then you know, unlike, say, a simple gradient descent algorithm, right, uh, this is something that you cannot just uh, you know, try at home. 
at least not in a few hours. <coughs> That's not going to do it. This, this re relies on a lot of machinery. So if you want to use integer programming, then you need to get much more into the, this, this, this is a much more involved type of computational model. So uh, the, the general purpose state-of-the-art solvers for integer programming, so the main players out there are, have these names, Gurobi, uh, Cplex, uh, FICO, and you know, there are a few others, and then there are also some open source solvers. They all rely on very efficient implementations of the relevant numerical linear algebra. They also rely on very, very efficient state-of-the-art implementations of the simplex method, because often you solve the relaxations are linear programming relaxations, so you want to solve them very efficiently. So simplex method, interior point methods, and all sorts of a whole um, suite of algorithms for convex optimization. Because linear programming and convex relaxations, those are uh, relied upon extensively to solve integer programs in a branch and bound or in a branch and cut um, scheme. And then the algorithms also use some kind of version of cutting a branch and cut. Most, most uh, algorithms that are implemented out there now use some version of this. And uh, naturally, I, ha I have given a very, very high level description of these algorithms. But if you think about the branching and how you do the enumeration, there are all sorts of considerations on how to uh, perform that enumeration uh, in terms of how to decide between branching at, or adding cutting planes. Again, there is a lot of different bells and whistles that can, can come up there, uh, and in particular, how to construct and maintain efficient cuts. All of that really is, is a major kind of software, software engineering project. So the, the solvers use a clever type of uh, branch and cut algorithm. As you can imagine, there have been also multiple dissertations that some of our students have written in uh, trying to develop more efficient integer programming solvers. And I'm sure that there will be more. Okay. Uh, and and the, another important thing is that the algorithms have to take advantage as much as possible of warm starts and um, tidal relaxations. So warm starts are very, very important because warm starts give you um, either or both of the following, upper bounds and lower bounds. And remember that one key idea for solving integer programs is that you, you keep generating upper bounds and lower bounds and, and try to squeeze them together. Uh, so, so the solvers uh, rely as much as possible on warm starts. And then there are some cool numbers here that essentially I have um, just uh, collected from different formal and informal sources. So they take, take these numbers. These are just kind of um, ballpark figures. So in the, say, in your lifetime, okay, I know that some of you are young, so between the time that you were born, or maybe a little before and now, in terms of the algorithmic advances, uh, algorithms have gotten roughly about half a million times faster. So even if we ran the same, if we use the same machine from 25 years ago, but we compare the algorithms that we had back then to the algorithms that we have now, the algorithms now would be half a million times faster. And where is that half a million? Well, that is all the different uh, tweaks and versions of simplex method, interior point methods, uh, cutting planes, all of that. And then on, at the same time, the hardware has gotten about half a million times faster. So memory and uh, processors are about half a million times faster. So if you take those two things combined, then that is really a very nice uh, difference in speed that we have, we, we can enjoy now compared to 25 years ago. Now, integer programming is still attempting to tackle NP-hard problems, right? Integer programming is NP-hard. So, you know, the fact that we get a speed up of 10 to the 11 doesn't mean that the game is over, but it really stacks the game much more in our favor. So, uh, in many different communities that were potential users of optimization. Uh, integer programming, for many years, in particular in statistics, 
this, this had been the case. Integer programming was thought of as, well, some kind of interesting modeling tool, but that you cannot really apply to solve real problems because, you know, it's MP hard. We don't have the computational infrastructure to solve it. Uh, but this helps. This makes problems that 20 years ago were not within reach now be within reach. And then during your career, chances are that we are going to add a few more numbers here, right? So uh, chances are that integer programming will be a technology that will be more available and viable for solving interesting problems. So, um, so this is kind of cool. Uh, so that essentially ends the first part of my, what I wanted to, dis to discuss today, and that was uh, essentially, you know, this other class of algorithms, cutting planes. So what I want to do in the remaining time that I have left is uh, talk about two examples. Okay, so this is kind of a, a natural uh, change of topics. Have I used this line in this class? I don't know if I have. I, uh, I have someone who was a student in my class before, in one of my classes before, and now it dawned on me. I don't think I have ever used the following sentence in this particular group. So there is going to be a change of topics, okay? a change of topics. So if your attention was drifting, right? if you were spacing out, this is a perfect opportunity to reboot your system, reboot your system, re-engage. We are switching topics. We are moving now from algorithms to two uh, very cool applications. And two applications that are actually very, very relevant to um, machine learning and uh, stats. And uh, we will spend the remaining time today uh, talking about those two applications. And I'll see how far I can make it. So the first is this very, very central problem in uh, regression. So uh, essentially the problem of selecting the best subset of uh, predictors for a regression problem. So I, if I ignore this constraint, this is just the standard uh, least squares problem, right? The one that uh, all of you know in your sleep, right? Least squares. Uh, but then we, uh, if this constraint would be an additional embellishment of that problem where we are interested in only using a small number of predictors. Okay, so we want our model only, we want beta only to use k, at most k of the predictors, all right? Uh, so here, the constraint, the constraint here is that the cardinality of beta should be less than or equal to k where uh, that norm zero is just the number of non-zero entries in beta, okay? So of course, this problem, the most, a widely uh, and a, a very well-known heuristic for this problem is uh, Lasso, uh, and it's known that it works well, and it's known that it, you can even prove that it solves the problem, provided that the data has some uh, convenient um, kind of uh, properties. So, uh, you know, Lasso is a model for that, but it's, in, in principle, it's, it's, it's not an exact uh, formulation for this problem is it's a heuristic that under the right conditions works well, okay? And that is, you know, that works uh, in many cases. So it turns out that we can give an exact formulation to this problem, and we discussed this last time. Let me flash this again. So this is an exact integer programming formulation. Uh, the key to get the integer programming formulation is to introduce new variables, new binary variables, z, so uh, zi, it's a binary variable that will indicate if the ith component will be included in the model. So we want the sum of those uh, zi's to be bounded by k, because we only want to include up to k predictors. And uh, we want also the uh, zi's to get the job done, right? That is to count the number of betas that are non-zero. So the betas and the z's have to be linked via this type of constraint. So uh, the constraint is that each bi in absolute value has to be bounded above by some uh, bound, let's say m times zi. So that way, if zi is zero, then that forces 
beta i to be out of the model. And if zi is 1, then beta i is allowed to be part of the model. All right? So the m here, the m has to be some kind of a priori bound that we can get a priori upper bound on the size of beta i. Okay? So uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss how you can compute m i, but I'll just say it is possible to compute m i by essentially sifting through x and y in a way that is not onerous. You, you, can, you can essentially do some kind of pre-processing over x and y and then get upper bounds on each of the uh, betas should they enter the model. Okay, so, so we have uh, this type of, so this is a, a formulation for the best subset selection problem. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that this formulation has been known for many years. Okay, this, this is nothing you know, particularly insightful and new. But what has been really, really interesting, and this is a very, very recent development, is a way of taking this formulation and actually make it work. Um, so t take this formulation and actually be able to solve it and solve it exactly. And the first time I heard about that was maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I, ever since I thought this was a really remarkable fact, right? Because, you know, before I heard about that, so until about two plus epsilon years ago, I used to think, well, if you want to solve that problem, you use lasso, and that's like the best that you can hope. You know, that the integer program is hopeless. It's, it's too difficult. Uh, but that is changing, and that is the story that I want to tell you. So let me keep the integer, yeah, let me keep the integer programming formulation here, and then tell you how is it that, uh, I mean, this is still an NP-hard problem, but how is it that integer programming technology can be made to uh, work for this problem, for interesting instances of that problem? And this is going to follow a, uh, a paper that appeared in Annals of Statistics uh, this year, 2016. It's a paper by these three guys, Bertsimas, King, and Masumder. And um, the paper uh, essentially just takes, makes uh, use of integer programming technology, but supplements that with a very clever idea. The, uh, one of the key ideas, and this is, this is um, an illustration of how you can sometimes solve difficult, um, some difficult optimization models. Sometimes just formulating the problem as, a, say, as a certain standard canonical class of problem that can get the job done. But sometimes that's only step one. Sometimes you, you have to do a little bit of extra work. So there is an idea that these guys developed that I think is extremely clever, and uh, it, it appears to really make a big difference in terms of solving the problem. And it's, it's a clever idea to get feasible solutions to the problem. It's, a, it's an idea to get uh, an approach to get upper bounds, okay, to get primal bounds. Uh, and the idea is uh, to consider this problem. So think about this problem, minimize some um, convex function of beta, subject to the constraint that uh, the cardinality of beta is bounded by k. So naturally, the best subset selection problem is a particular case of that problem. Okay, this is actually a bit more general. Uh, you know, this, it covers this in, in addition to potentially other problems. So what is the idea that these guys came up with? This is incredibly clever. Uh, so suppose that I want to do that, and g is a smooth uh, convex function, and the gradient of g is Lipschitz. What these guys proposed is some kind of first-order method for this problem. Okay, this is sort of a discrete first-order method. It's sort of a discrete first of the method. The key observation, the key observation is this observation. If you think about this problem, that is, given u, find the beta that is closest to u uh, with some sparsity restriction on beta. So the beta that is closest to u that has only k non-zero entries. If you think about that for a moment, uh, the answer is actually 
the answer that you would intuitively guess. And that is, you know, think about this. The answer is kind of the answer that you would generate if you were to solve the problem in a greedy fashion. And then if you think a little bit more, you, you can convince yourself that, of course, that is the answer. And that is, well, you look at u, right? And then you look at the largest entries of u in absolute value, the largest k entries. And then you make beta match those entries. And the other betas you set to 0. So if you do that, you can solve this problem. So this problem is easy to solve. Okay? And there's some kind of hard uh, thresholding. That's why it's labeled H. Okay? Hard uh, thresholding. You keep the k largest entries of beta. And all the others you set to 0. So this is easy to do. So then uh, what did those guys do uh, for, for this problem? They suggested the following. They suggested the following. So to solve this problem, okay, they suggested this kind of discrete first order algorithm. Essentially do gradient descent, but supplemented with a hard thresholding. So uh, you start with some initial beta, and then every time you do something that is just like gradient descent, but then you do hard thresholding. Uh, that way, you ensure that your beta is going to be uh, have the right cardinality. Okay, and uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but it, in, in their paper, they show that if you do this, then the, the sequence of the betas converges to some limit, beta bar, where that beta bar is some kind of a fixed point of this type of iteration. So the beta bar satisfies this uh, equation. So the beta bar is sort of, uh, if you kind of think a little, how should I put it, uh, uh, broadly, the beta bar is kind of like a local solution to the uh, minimization with cardinality constraints uh, problem. Okay? It's not guaranteed to be the global solution. Okay? It's not guaranteed to be the global solution. The original problem, in particular, includes the best subset as, a, uh, as one um, particular case. So it's an NP-hard problem. It, it, it wouldn't be solvable with such a simple algorithm. But this produces good solutions. Yeah, good solutions. So, uh, so let me say a few, uh, describe a few computational results. So here is uh, for some particular problem. Uh, this is kind of this illustrates the behavior of the algorithm, and this is something that doesn't. Uh, so sometimes it happens for integer programs, and it may be a little counterintuitive. So remember something we discussed last time. To solve an integer program, typically you generate a sequence of upper bounds and a sequence of lower bounds. And uh, you know that you are optimal or that you are near optimal when the upper bound and the lower bound are close to each other. Now, something that sometimes could happen is that the upper bound is optimal but the lower bound, it is still far, so I don't know that I'm optimal. So here, during all this time, the upper bound doesn't change. All this work is just to figure out, just to realize that you have an upper bound. I'm sorry, that, you have, that the upper bound is optimal. Okay, so uh, this is something that sometimes, I guess, is, is not unusual of uh, what happens when you do mixed integer uh, programming. It may be that it takes a long time, not, not so much to find the optimal solution, but to verify that the solution that you have found is indeed optimal, okay? that there is no better solution. And the reason for that, again, I want to repeat something I mentioned last time, is that the, uh, there is not an easy way to check that a solution is optimal. There is no simple optimality condition for integer programming. Uh, instead, we have to resort to bounds. So for that reason, this. So this is here in seconds. Uh, and this is a you know, kind of relatively small data set. What makes this problem interesting and difficult is the fact that we are 
uh, solving the exact formulation for the best subset problem. So that's that. Uh, something else that I find very, very, oh, sorry, I didn't mention this on the right. So here, this plot is essentially the same thing as this plot here. This is the uh, mixed integer programming gap. So this is just the, uh, the gap here means the gap, the difference between the current upper bound and lower bound. Okay, the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. So as you can see, uh, essentially there is zero when we, when we finish and we realize that, they, um, that we have found the optimal solution. So that's, uh, that is a typical behavior of the algorithm. Uh, the, using warm starts, so the warm start here is what you get if you do this. Okay, you, so, sorry, more accurately, if you do this. So if you, if the, the blue line here, the blue line is the behavior of the mixed integer program if you do a cold start. So if you just do cold start, that is, you, we, we look at the uh, formulation of the best subset problem. The formulation was what we had here, right? So we look at this formulation. We do the best we can to generate uh, good bounds because the tighter the bounds, remember, the tighter the relaxation, the better for the branch and bound scheme. If we do that and just feed that to uh, state-of-the-art mixed integer programming solver, thus the blue line illustrates the behavior of the gap. If instead we complement this with a warm start, where the warm start is given by the result of this algorithm, then uh, what happens is what you see in the red line. Okay? So the warm star can really make a substantial difference when you're solving a mixed integer program. So there is a certain element of art sometimes or you know, tailor-made solutions when dealing with a difficult optimization problem. Right? You, you can then uh, um, make a certain approach that is particularly tailored to the problem of interest. So that is an illustration here. One more thing that I want to say about the best subset uh, problem is with regard to uh, sparsity detection. So this is a comparison between different algorithms. And this is for, uh, all of this is for uh, some made up, some artificially, uh, some synthetic data sets. So uh, the, the authors just created a, a number of different uh, insta uh, instances where uh, the, the response variable was a combination of only 10 predictors and then created a larger set of predictors and then applied their algorithm to see if the algorithm would recover the proper set of predictors. So in, in the comparison with other approaches, like uh, the blue one is lasso, uh, the pink one is uh, step based regression, and the red one is uh, sparse net that uses some kind of uh, another non convex um, approach to the subset selection problem. So, the results of the mixed integer model generally are, are pretty good in terms of re, uh, sparsity recovery. Okay, so, that's sparsity detection. So, that's that. Uh, there are a few more you know, things that we can say about this model, but I think uh, as far as what I planned on telling you today, that's all. So the other model that I want to tell you a few words about is the least median or of squares regression. Uh, if we are going to take a break, I think this is probably the right moment to do that. Uh, so why don't we take five minutes I'll get a chance to get a sip of water if you need one, two. Then, uh, it's 2.30 in that clock, so we'll resume in five minutes at 2.35. So, uh, yes, Ryan was questioning the, um, the label of clever here, right? Uh, and he made me realize that uh, if you think about the hard thresholding, so you can, you can see this as... Um, just a projection, right? So if you think about the, uh, it's just a, it's a projection onto a, uh, 
non-convex set, right? But if you think about this operation here, right? This is finding the projection of u on the set of sparse vectors, of k sparse vectors. So that's, that's all that you're doing here. So, so you could see the entire um, a discrete first order algorithm as a kind of uh, proximal gradient algorithm uh, where this essentially is that proximal step. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So anyway, that is that. And uh, again, the, the one thing that I find interesting about this is the fact that it can, co it can find good solutions, not necessarily optimal, but uh, good solutions, some kind of stationary solutions, local uh, solutions. And when combined with the uh, mixed integer program, then they can really enhance the, the performance of the mixed integer um, solver. Okay. So in the last few minutes that I have left, let me say a few words about this uh, other model. This is the least median of squares uh, regression. And uh, uh, so let me tell you what I know about this. And I'm sure that most of you, or well, maybe at least some of you, some of you, uh, at least one person in this room knows a lot more about uh, this business, right? So, uh, so we have this standard, again, suppose that we have that data there, right? Uh, our predictors and our response uh, observations. The least squares is uh, what minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals. Uh, the least absolute deviation would minimize the, uh, the sum of the absolute values of the residuals. Uh, the first one is a very simple, unconstrained, quadratic uh, minimization problem that actually you can solve in closed form. The second one, if you think about it for a moment, is a linear programming uh, model that, again, has, uh, is amenable to an efficient algorithm. In principle, because we take absolute values here instead of squares, then the second one uh, would be a little less sensitive to outliers. Right? Now, this other uh, regression here, if we look at the minimizer of the median of the residuals, that is called the uh, least median of squares. And uh, one of the motivations for this is that this is a more robust regression model. Uh, so. This is the part that I'm going to dare uh, say a few words about, knowing that some, in, some people in the room know more. The um, breakdown point of this estimator is much better than the breakdown point of the other two estimators. And the breakdown point, uh, the way I understand it, is that how much of the data you can grossly corrupt without grossly corrupting the estimator. So if you think about the least squares, it, it suffices for one data point to be grossly corrupted for the entire estimator to be nonsense, right? Uh, by contrast, the least median of squares uh, estimator in the limit, uh, you can corrupt almost half of the data and still the estimator will not get completely corrupted. So it's, it's a much more robust estimator. Maybe a simple, a simple instantiation of this is if you compare the sample mean with the median of just a collection of numbers, right? The sample mean uh, can get thrown off by one single uh, corrupted observation, whereas the median, you would have to corrupt essentially about half of the data to, um, to make it be completely corrupted. So, uh, so that's one of the attractive features of the estimators. Now, so that's nice in the, from the point of view of that it has this nice robustness property. But the downside is that finding that in contrast to finding the least squares or the least absolute deviation estimators, in contrast to those two, which are relatively manageable convex programming uh, or convex optimization model, this one uh, is also a difficult problem. It's an NP-hard problem. So uh, in more generally, we can talk about the least quantile. So let me put here. So this is least median of squares. The least quantile of squares is to uh, find the beta that makes the, um, the qth 
absolute residual be the smallest. Okay, so the least median of squares is a special case of that when Q is n over two. Right? Uh, more generally, if we if we pick Q any of the any any number between one and n, then we have a uh, a version of that problem. So what I'm going to describe next is something that is going to follow a very similar template to the previous model, the previous example, and that is a mixed integer programming formulation, number one. And number two, a kind of simple idea to generate good heuristic solutions. And number three, how the mixed integer um, model performs in some uh, data. So it turns out that for this problem, the mixed integer programming formulation is not at all straightforward. I have to say that I have to confess that I actually attempted to think about this and come up with a formulation of my own. And at least within you know, the limited time that I devoted to it, I, it, it, was not, it didn't jump to me. Okay? It's not that straightforward. So here, here is one formulation. Uh, I imagine there might be other formulations for this problem, but here is one that works. So here is the problem. And we can actually formulate the least quantile of squares problem. You can formulate it this way. The key step in the formulation is to introduce some extra variables uh, in some way to keep track of whether the particular uh, residual that I need to optimize is bigger than or less than the absolute value of the ith residual. Okay, that's kind of the key. We use binary variables for that purpose. So the formulation is going to be like this. The mu variables, the mu variables, mu and mu bar, indicate where gamma here, essentially gamma is going to be our RQ, okay? Gamma will stand for RQ. So this is going to be modeled as, in the model, this is going to be gamma. And to model this kind of constraint, this kind of constraint we will, uh, this is what the, I guess the, um, the first two constraints essentially tell me whether gamma is going to be below or above Ri. Now, uh, when the mu i's are equal to zero, when the mu i's are equal to zero, that means that gamma is above those corresponding residuals. When the mu i bar is uh, equal to zero, that means that uh, gamma is below those residuals. So essentially, the mu i bar and the mu i, uh, the, first, the first of them are going to be, uh, there's going to be a threshold, and then the first, say, q of them will have to be positive, and the last q of the other ones has to be positive. So, so that leads to these two constraints that are in, in um, kind of similar to the type of constraints that connected beta with z in the previous model. Then the key is that z, the sum of the z variables, is going to be q, and that will indicate that the first q entries of mu, I guess mu bar, the first q entries of mu bar will be allowed to be positive, uh, and the last uh, n minus q entries of mu i too. So, Mu i and mu i bar are not negative. The z i's are binary. And this entire thing now is our mixed integer programming model. So as you can see, it's, it's you know, quite a bit more elaborate than the formulation that we saw earlier. There is one more complication that comes up here and that I purposely decided not to discuss, but you can, it can be resolved. Uh, there is one more complication that comes up here, and I, I would like to give you a, a few seconds to Take a look at that and tell me if there is something about that formulation that is not to like. There is something about that formulation that is a little bit to dislike, uh, that I, at least I dislike. Uh, you know, this is fine, binary, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. But there, are, there is something about those two, the first two, one of those that is not fine. Let me be a bit more explicit. There is something about the first inequality that is not fine. What is, what is not to like about that first inequality? 
Okay, maybe it's not that simple. The, the, the part that is not to like about that first inequality is that the absolute value, we have a lower bound on the absolute value. That is a non-convex uh, constraint, okay? So you could massage that and turn it into a convex constraint by introducing other, uh, another set of binary variables. So you could, at the end, make the whole thing be a uh, convex plus binary uh, constraints, okay? Uh, but this is, in, in some sense, the gist of the integer programming model. Now, just the same way as before, we can, uh, we can produce, we can essentially uh, come up with a first order algorithm for uh, producing good solutions to the problem. So in this case, the formulation is based on a different observation. Observe that the, the absolute value of the qth uh, order residual can be expressed as the difference between these two quantities where hq here is the sum of the uh, entries, the q, q and above residuals, okay? And the q and above residuals, if we, if we look not just at the q, the q residual, but the sum of the q largest residuals, that actually can be expressed as, an, as a linear program. So that is nice, nicely manageable. So this hq is a, a convex function. The hq is a convex function, and the, the function that we are trying to optimize is the difference between these two convex functions. So uh, the problem, this problem, right, or this problem, the same, is a very difficult problem, but it's the difference of two convex uh, problems. So then you can uh, hit it with a subgradient algorithm, produce some local min, and then you have something similar. So here is uh, some, some, some computational results if you run the um, mixed integer program. And we have a similar phenomenon to the previous example. A lot of time takes, uh, a lot of the time is taken just to verify that the upper bound that we have found for a while is optimal in some examples. And something similar happens if we use warm starts, then the algorithm can uh, perform a lot better. If we use warm starts, then we can figure out that the, low, that the upper bound is optimal much faster than if we, if we use a cold start. Uh, so right with just uh, maybe 20 seconds to spare, I, um, I managed to actually made it, make it through this. So let me conclude with uh, a few references. So. Uh, you know, this is only two, two um, meetings on a subject that is really, that you, could, you could fill an entire course with, mixed integer programming. So these are some of the sources that I used for uh, these two last, the, the last two lectures. So the first uh, survey is a very nice survey on mixed integer nonlinear optimization. I think the nonlinear part is especially interesting for this audience. So I recommend that. If you do a Google search, you can easily find that. Uh, the two papers that describe the, the last two examples are uh, these two papers that appeared in the Annals of Statistics. And then there are these two very nice books that are on integer programming. Uh, so this one, uh, Corne Jules is, uh, I, I already mentioned his name, he's a colleague at the Tepper School. And then uh, Comforti and Zambelli were um, students of him. So they graduated a number of years ago. Uh, they both are in, they both are Italian. Conforti is in some university, I think Bologna, and Sambelli is in London. And then the, there is an old book, but I still find it extremely readable. It's maybe the nicest, most accessible book for integer programming is by Woolsey. Uh, it's a little bit old, but it's still a very nice read. Uh, so with that, let me conclude today. Uh, and before you all go away, remember, if you haven't, completed your peer reviews, do them now. <laughs>